When I was a kid, we, meaning my folks, rented an old Victorian house in an old working class neighborhood. It had probably been about a hundred years old at the time, and that was decades ago. I suppose for a Victorian house, it wasn't particularly big for the style, though maybe a little larger than the more modern homes in the neighborhood. For a kid, it seemed huge. Part playhouse, part playground, part castle. It seemed like there was always something to explore, though I'd been in every room in the house many times by the time we'd unpacked. I think it was all the little features you don't always find in typical modern houses that piqued my interest. There was the parlor, with the big wooden staircase and huge banister. There was the old stained glass window over the front door, the coal hatch and bunker, the funny little two-door tunnel-like cabinet between the kitchen and the mudroom, old electric outlets and gaslight pipe ends that were far out of use. I remember we called the place the Parsons House. That wasn't the name of the family who first built the house, which is the usual naming convention for historically relevant homes. It was just the name of our landlord, Ralph Parson. Apparently, he was an acquaintance of my father's. He was renting out his house because he was traveling in Europe for a couple of years, and we happened to be in the market. I met him once or twice before we moved in. What little I remember was that I was uncomfortable being around him. To be fair, I remember being uncomfortable around any older adults. He was tall, strangely thin, had a white shock of unkempt hair, and I suppose he was equally uncomfortable around children, despite making an attempt to be cordial. The other thing I remember is that he wore an ascot, about 15 or 20 years after ascots had gone out of fashion. It was a vivid orange. I suppose I remember that because it was just like Fred's, out of Scooby-Doo cartoons. Oh, and I remember my parents mentioning his profession as a curator. At the time, I thought that meant he was some sort of doctor. In retrospect, maybe that was why he'd been moving to Europe for those two years. He was collecting. Anyway, I bring up that old man because of what he'd left behind. He'd left us with plenty of open storage place, but he'd lived in that house a long time, and he hadn't cleared out everything. When I first started exploring that house, I'd found all sorts of odd, curious wonders, stuffed away in the back of cubby holes, corners of the attic, and down in the cellar. Early on, my mother told me not to pull it out and play with it, probably half in concern that I'd break Mr. Parsons' property, partly because it was dirty old junk and I could have gotten tetanus or something. I remember a tall giraffe figurine. It was probably the most toy-like object though I resisted my temptations to play with it. There was a large mask, probably painted paper mache now that I think about it. It seemed African in its artistic stylings. There was an enormous carved crystal bowl, maybe a punch bowl. In the dusty sunbeam coming through the window, it cast a myriad of little rainbow spectra in the corner of the attic where I found it. There was an enormous bulbous walnut burl, uncarved, that I'd guess any woodworking hobbyist would have gone nuts to discover. The house had two outbuildings, one a garage, just a three-walled carport, really, big enough to fit a compact car. If I had been told it had been built to house an old Model T, that wouldn't have surprised me. Then there was the shed. We never used this building. Despite what we called it, it was larger than the garage. It was relatively long and had been divided up into three sections, walls with a single open portal between them. I hadn't thought about it at the time, but now I suppose it must have once been a stable for horses, years before Model Ts were ever invented. It likely hadn't used horses for at least that long. We never used it because it had been filled with junk. The real repository for Mr. Parson's stuff, or maybe earlier tenants. I'm trying to remember all of the stuff it contained, though I'm only coming up with blanks. I do remember a thick pile of doors. Except for front doors, most doors these days are thin, lightweight, mass-produced things meant to work as reliable firewalls in the event of a fire. Back then, they were all thick, heavy, expertly carved wood. The kind of people who restore houses, like the woodworkers and the burl, no doubt would have thought that pile of doors would have been a jackpot find. There was furniture. 
I think I remember an old green chair, well faded and upholstery torn up and moth ridden. Literal brass tacks had held the upholstery together, and in my curiosity, I probably would have picked a few of them out myself. It was long past any reasonable use as furniture. If there'd been parts of an old Model T or horse-drawn carriages stored away in the back of those three chambers, I'd have missed it. I can remember thinking, this is just what happens to old stuff. Stuff that's not perfect and doesn't end up in a museum or antique shop. Stuff that gets worn out or scratched up, because that's what happens to things that get used. Mr. Parsons rejects. My explorations were reserved for a small pathway just inside the door, and along the length of the exterior wall, it was free enough from debris that I was able to clamber over the clutter. It was in the third chamber I found the bottles. I'm not sure if anybody else in my family ever got that far in. Not my parents, not my siblings. Just me and my curiosity and willingness to climb over junk. There were a few dozen of them, I supposed. They were in a couple of shallow boxes. Or forms. They sort of reminded me of chocolate boxes without the lids. The bottles were small, all glass, perhaps the size of modern fingernail paint bottles, and filled with liquids. I couldn't figure out what the contents were. Most of them were white, the liquids. They were different kinds, too. Some were solid white. Some were some sort of suspension of white particles and clear liquid. In some of them, the white had precipitated out to the bottom. Some had developed weird iridescent or opalescent sheens, I'd guess after expiring their best-buy dates. Whatever on earth that was. Others were different shades of gray. Some bordered on purple, though it was hard to tell in the dim shed. Some of them might have started off white and had decayed into those shades of gray with time. I opened the glass stoppers, and they all had strong smells. This did nothing to help me identify them. They were all strong chemical smells. I was sort of reminded of paint, and given the size of the bottles, one might guess they had really been fingernail polish, or perhaps those small bottles of paints used by model hobbyists to finish their projects. It wasn't paint, though. I was sure of that. Now any chemist will tell you that the paint we use today is of an entirely different formulation than the paints from 40 years ago, and far removed from paints used long before that. Still, I was sure this wasn't paint. It was like no solvents I'd smelled before or since. It also wasn't unpleasant. In some ways it smelled like perfume, which can be both pleasant and chemically repugnant in the wrong setting. But it wasn't that either. Nobody would have worn this stuff as perfume. It remains a mystery. Then I found the black bottle. It was stuck between the end of the form and the shallow wall of the box the form lay in. It was small, like the others, though tall and slender, fluted over most of its length, and it flared at either end, the bottom for its base, the top for the stopper. In some ways, it resembled a chess piece and was about the size of a large one, perhaps a bishop, given the roundish stopper. It was just plain black, the glass itself. It could have been obsidian, for all I know. It fully obscured whatever it contained. On the very first night of those 1001 Arabian stories, Scheherazade tells her gruesome groom a story of a genie in a bottle. It's not the rotund, jovial genie of the Thief of Baghdad or the Disney picture. A poor, elderly Hemingway-esque fisherman is having the worst luck pulling up junk in his net. Then, in his last cast of the day, he pulls up a strange copper tube with a leaden stopper bearing the seal of wise King Solomon, the demonologist. The fisherman pulls the stopper, and the djinn erupts from the tube like a storm and nightmare. The djinn is angry and announces he'll kill the fisherman. The story grows darker, and we find out this is a heretical genie who won't listen to appeals to God. His evil nature was why Solomon had imprisoned him in the first place. The genie, for countless aeons, had considered granting the man who freed him three wishes. Yet he had grown mad and murderous over his years of imprisonment and now knew only anger. There's some Atlantean fairy tale wordplay, and the genie is tricked back into the bottle. 
I suppose everybody prefers a happy ending. There was thin black dust that fell from the bottle when I slowly turned the cap, as if its liquid contents had spilled over when sealed, and then dried. There was more when I pulled out the cap, lighter stuff, that formed a brief twisting cloud that rapidly dissipated. No violent genie. Then I noticed the smell. Black cherries. Walnut oil. Cut grass. Buttered pasta. Honeydew. Burning motor oil on a hot engine block. I don't mean to sound like a pretentious sommelier, but I smelled these things, individually and simultaneously, distinct and particular. It wasn't like the others. You expect a bottle of strange liquid to have a certain alien smell, not an overpowering mix of the familiar. This was wrong. I resealed the bottle, carefully placed it back in its box, and fled the shed with a strange sense that I'd done something very wrong. The term neurotoxin brings a lot of dark concepts to mind. The human brain and nervous system are complex things that even modern scientists aren't even close to fully understanding. One might be forgiven for thinking a neurotoxin, literally nerve poison, is a correspondingly complex subject. In fact, most are quite simple. They simply clog up the little salt channels in your nerve cells and cut off signals. In the same way, a thrombosis in your blood vessels leads to heart attacks. Blocking your nerve signals leads to paralysis, seizures, cramps, and so on. There's an odd outlier, though, in the world of neurotoxins. The venom of a tiny box jellyfish, the Irukandji jellyfish, can cause a syndrome of the same name, most of the symptoms are what you'd expect. Inflammation, cramps, intense pain, and possible death in extreme cases. The oddest one, though, is an unmistakable and irresistible sense of impending doom. Victims report it becomes so intense that they can think of nothing else but dread, and it can last for days. Some patients, who are often hospitalized due to the other symptoms, have reportedly begged their own doctors to euthanize them rather than let them face the doom they were certain was about to destroy them. It's an odd case of a simple poison affecting higher brain function. I'm not suggesting that what I released from that bottle was a simple neurotoxin. No. I think it was far worse, and not in any way natural. I'm not sure what I'm trying to suggest. Maybe just that there's some sort of force or evil in the universe, and our brains are somehow hardwired to key in on it if it's ever encountered. Maybe Irukandji toxin simply triggers that response inappropriately, a coincidental connection between the supernatural and the biochemical. The dread came slowly. It started as nightmares at first. Usual stuff. Then they came every night and that didn't seem normal to me. I'd talk to other people about it. I guess the way any kid will talk about a nightmare. Most I talked to didn't seem to care, and I suppose they had no reason to. I think, from my perspective, I was trying to call for help because I didn't know how. I think my mother started to pick up on it the first, as you'd expect. She certainly noticed when I started fighting against going to bed, or not wanting to go out in the morning to go to school, or leave the school to go home. Pretty much everybody was concerned by then. I don't remember a lot of specifics of the dreams themselves. Just vague impressions of being at home, or being at school, having a usual day with the usual people around me. Then I could feel the doom coming, and nothing I could do would make me or the people around me safe. Then. It started to manifest itself into a person. A man I could not see. A man whose location I did not know, but I somehow knew he was approaching. I'd wake in cold sweats from those dreams. Not that it mattered. Because the impending doom followed. I'd be in normal daily situations, surrounded by people I knew, and I couldn't keep them or myself safe from certain disaster. The nightmares in real life were indistinguishable. He was coming. A man in a long black car. He was right around the corner, and I'd scream and scream until they could convince me that nobody was there. Then it would all happen again. We'd end up moving out of the Parsons' place a few months later. 
My old man needed a higher paying job. My mom needed a closer drive to the doctors and the psychologists and the therapists. My unusual collection of symptoms would subside over the next few weeks. It wasn't the treatments. I, though I never told anybody, am still convinced it was because we left that place, next to the shed. We'd given doom the slip. After a quick proofreading, I realized some of you might be wondering how I could connect these two sequences of events with each other, or why I, as a kid who couldn't even remember his own nightmares, might remember such a specific series of smells coming from that black bottle. What purpose would I have to give it so much focus? That answer is simple. It's because I'm smelling them again now as I write this. It's why I'm writing this. Black cherries, walnut oil, cut grass, buttered pasta, honeydew, burning motor oil on a hot engine block. That scent is on the air again, wafting past my face. Like a trigger, all those thoughts have exploded back into my brain. It's coming for me again. It's in my town. It is about to turn off the main road into my housing development, and soon it will turn down my street. All these years, all this distance, in the end, it didn't matter. It still found me. I wonder if somebody found the bottle. Maybe they made the mistake of opening it.